when they come into the shop, well, they were got they got a kick out uh, teasing the, the kid in each one, but uh, the errors that he would make, uh, the home runs, or, uh, the, the, they make a great play, a shortstop, or an outfielder who, who hit the longest uh, home run and everything. So uh, they they would just ride one another and kid one another right on through, you know. They got a lot of kick out of it. So most of all of them, they, they, uh, at the time that when they came in uh, to Newark to play, they would visit our shop. And most of the time they would be stationed at the Grand Hotel. They would go up to the Grand Hotel. My father used to take me there all the time and I met, you know, Dobie and Irvin and, you know, I thought that was the greatest thing in my life, shaking their hands and talking to them. And the whole, ambiance, if you will, of the place, you know, of, um, you know, well-dressed, uh, um, you know, smooth black folks, uh, celebrities, and some that look like celebrities, whether I knew their name or not. I used to kid with the, the famous Monty Irvin about his big bat, because I was a pitcher at the time. And I'd say, Monty, that bat is awful big. It looks oversized. It's the, the, the top of the bat looks awful large. He said, oh, don't worry about it. I get hit with a little one, too. And he could. He was just a natural hitter. Many of those fellows who were down in Houston for the All-Star game, uh, they couldn't have made Pittsburgh Crawfords. They couldn't have played with the Newark Eagles, with Monty Irvin and Larry Doby and them played with them. In their heyday, when they had 12, 14 men on the team, they couldn't have played with them. They couldn't have made the club. The Newark Eagles were, was an exceptional team. They, they were very good. I can remember them very well. They were a very good team, and uh, there weren't many teams that really could beat them. During that particular time, I got to know uh, uh, Effie Manley very well and uh, Abe, who uh, most of the time, when it wasn't a ball game one, you would find Abe over in his tavern over on the other side of West Market Street. That's where he hung out and played checkers with an old buddy. But uh, Effie was the one who ran the team. When I came back from the Army in 1946 to the Eagles, because that, that was the experience that I remembered playing baseball with the Newark Eagles, and that was the life that I wanted to come back to. And I returned to the Eagles, and as luck would have it, that was the year of the fabulous championship Newark Eagles. The baseball boys, the pitchers on the wall, they got a kick out of talking about the baseball and especially talking about who uh, Mule Sellers and he hit the longest home run. Uh, sa uh, half Saturday called everybody from the out, uh, outfield in and was the uh, struck out the rest of the team. <laughs> what happened? We took an all star team to, to Caracas, Venezuela that year. We took Jackie along because he had been signed to give him some more experience, you know, to try to help him. So the manager of the club at that time was Felton Snow, that used to manage the Baltimore Elite Giants, was the manager of this all-star team. So he called me, he said, Benson, he said, I'm going to give Jackie to you for a roommate. Well, I knew Jackie's history. He had fought everybody else. <laughs> I knew he was mean. <laughs> And uh, I said, why give him to me? So he said, well, he said, you seem to get along with everybody. I think you can help him. So Jackie and I got along real, real well. We talked night after night about baseball. And I think the only thing that really stuck with him that I told him after all the talking that we had done, because I had played against all of the good major league pitchers and everything, and I knew what they had, you know. I told him one night, I said, Jackie, I said, one thing I want you to remember when you go to the major leagues, remember this, that where you're coming from is harder than where you're going. when the people start going in at 12.30 for a two o'clock game, because there was some kind of ordinance in Newark that you couldn't begin parades or, or baseball games or any kind of public events like that on a Sunday until between 1.30 
and 2 o'clock. I think 1 o'clock may have been the time. But the, base, the black baseball games were at 2 to give the people from, who were coming from church an opportunity to get there. And as I said before, people would come with big picnic hampers loaded with chicken and potato salad and barbecue and cornbread and you name it. And they would just sort of pass among the, their friends who were there or among other people who were just sitting around uh, some of the food. It was a, it was a great socialization uh, period. I won't forget it, and as a young girl, uh, I, I still remember it, and I remember the fun times we used to have. What motivated me was uh, these black clubs. I'm talking about clubs like the uh, Kansas City Monarchs or the Homestead Grays or the Lincoln Giants or Pittsburgh Crawfords. When they would come in, we would all make sure that we would go down to see them play. We, we uh, uh, had heard, you know, they'd. Uh, advertised uh, great players like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson and Coop Copperbell and Judy Johnson and uh, men, men of this caliber. Uh, and we'd go down and, and we could, you know, being black, we could really relate to, you know, the way these fellows were playing. All right, so then uh, you have to remember too that uh, this was an era before uh, 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 Joe Lewis had, had not come into being. Uh, Jesse Owens uh, uh, was not famous. Uh, Jackie Robinson had not come on the scene. Consequently, uh, to see a black team play so magnificently well really gave, uh, uh, really gave us a lift. I'm talking about the athlete, gave the athlete a lift, plus it gave the black people uh, something to cheer for because you remember uh, you have to remember that uh, uh, we didn't have, at that time, we had very few heroes. And uh, being low on the totem pole, we wanted a role model. We wanted somebody to cheer for. And these uh, black teams provided uh, that kind of entertainment. It was like a, a cultural ritual because, especially in the middle of America at that time, in the 40s, uh, I mean, you know, there were certain very negative, uh, formal kind of uh, estimates of black people's worth by the mainstream society, and yet every Sunday, I mean, um, you, could, you could feel the kind of uh, communion that was going on between the people and the players, uh, really expressing, you know, a life that was much, it seems to me, more profound than, uh, certainly than what people thought, you know, black life was about. But then it turns out even more profound in the mainstream of American life. There was a communication between the fans and the ball players in black baseball that didn't exist in white baseball. The fans were kidding the players, the players were kidding the fans. So Lou saying, Top is swinging this, he's going to go to bat. And some little thin colored woman, I think she weighed about 90 pounds, she's standing down front. She hollers the same Top. Hey, Louis said, what are you going to do, bring me some wood? This was an expression that they had coined. Uh, bringing wood was a strikeout. If a guy struck out, he called me, bring me some wood. So Lou Santop pointed to the right field fence like Babe Ruth did. He, much as I say, I'm going to knock this ball over the fence. This little, little right cool woman says, I bet you a buck you can't, you can't do it. So Santop went over to his manager, bought a buck, came over, stuck it through the chicken wire in the lady's hands. <laughs> he says, you can hold the stakes. He went up there and knocked the first ball of the fence. <laughs> when he came around, he trotted right over to the place, got the thing from the lady, and I never saw a lady more happy to, to lose a buck. <laughs> and the whole stand started to roar. It showed they, they appreciated it. They, this was a communication between the two that that uh, I always admired in black baseball. When slavery ended in the 1860s, blacks entered the world of segregation. They entered a, a country which was establishing, in fact, two separate and unequal societies. Negro baseball would come to represent what was, in many ways, best in the separate world of black America. It was a business, it was a ceremony, it was a uh, a means by which blacks in the late 19th and early 20th century, throughout the 
the, the first half of the 20th century would become a modern people. As far as the structure of the Negro Leagues is concerned, they had an Eastern League, they had a, a, a Western League, a Western Division. The, the Eastern Division was called the uh, National League, Negro National League. The Western Division was called the uh, Negro um, American League. They would play designated league games. Some games would be league games and some would be exhibition. But every time we played, we would know which was a league game and which was not. So they would tabulate all of the league games and uh, the winner of each league would play uh, a World Series at the end of the year. It was patterned pretty much after the, the major leagues. So we came in on the in the dugout, Chester Buchanan was pitching. He called all out there together, he told us, said now next time they hit something out there, just let it go. Let them keep running, let them get a home run. And told Chester Buchanan, and you ain't gonna get no help. <laughs> so you just might as well make up your mind to get these people out if you want to go home tonight. And they said, I ain't running my outfielders to death either. He said, so you make up your mind, you know, check out the people out there. <laughs> No, this is a different era altogether than what it was when we came along. Uh, I feel that the, the Major League ball player of today, he couldn't have played in our league. No way, no way for him to play in it with the uh, traveling and, and the way we had to play. Get to the ballpark a half hour, hour before the ball, ball game, and you dress in your bus, not in the, in the, in the, in the ballpark. And you go out on the ball field, the umpire said, play ball, you don't have no warm up things like that and, and overnight you finish a ball game like we we finish like we play in Chicago and we got a double header to play in Philadelphia we get the ball park five o'clock we got to be on the ball field six o'clock the ball players couldn't do that I, I understand they they don't want to play a, a double head on getaway day <laughs> we, we don't want to play a day game, game after night <laughs> yeah they fly in four games a day <laughs> and had to travel 13 1400 miles it, it, it's you just couldn't do it we had a ball player. Well, Barney Brown, he was a top pitcher. He could play outfield. Yeah. And he could hit. Huh? He could, they would pinch hit him for people. Regular ball player. With left hand is pitching. Yeah, with anybody. They make no, well, that, see, that left hand, right hand thing didn't exist when we played. That's right. <clears throat> if you were a regular and you couldn't, if you left hand hitter and you were a regular and you could never hit left hand pitching, then you, you didn't have playing. no job. That's true. All the majors, I don't see it in the American or the National League, playing in the inside baseball. When I lived, all we wanted was one run. A guy like Max Pitcher or Leon, all you need was one run. Heck, you shut the other team down. That's all, play that inside baseball. <laughs> A lot of times I tell people when, when, when we play homestead grades, if Cool Papa get on second base and Jeremy Benjamin come up and lay a bunt down third base, that's all they need, because Cool gonna dust off at home plate. <laughs> that ain't no lie. <laughs> Leon was the type of ball player that always, uh, he believed in uh, what he called putting something on your mind. And that was, when you come into that batter's box, you were getting paid to hit the ball and he was getting paid to pitch. And the best thing and the easiest thing on his mind was to keep you from hitting the ball. If I had to put some rosin on it or put some, cut it, or lick it, whatever he had to do, and then Leon would pitch you close and tight. That's the type of ball player that he was. But the only thing i like to say about that was they paying him to throw at me. Yes. Throw it, yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, well, definitely. <laughs> now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> most, of, most of the pitchers you, you, that <laughs> usually cut the ball, clean our leg, you throw anything. Most yeah. of the pitchers that cut the ball and, and, and shine it and <clears throat> emery ball on, they throw hard. I mean, they really, they wasn't any pitcher that just threw the ball up there and hit you, wouldn't hurt you. These guys threw, threw the ball so hard, they put a, put a hole in it. <laughs> 
<laughs> down, down around Ocean City. We had to go down there one night, and they had this Pete Gray. He was the one-armed ball player. And the first time, he was leadoff hitter. And his first time up, we, we nonchalantly looked around at him. And I think the first or second hit, he got a hit off of Leon. Leon looked at him, he standing over there on first. He said, well, I'll tell you what, will you come back up the next time? And I guess it was around about the third or fourth inning, and he came back again. And Leon threw it right up under his, right under his neck. And he didn't hit any more that night. It was easier to play in the major leagues because you didn't have as much opposition going either way. In our league, there was nothing outlawed, nothing. They threw at you intentionally. The umpires sure. knew it. Everybody knew it. Shot in the spike. They shot in the spike. You walk yeah. in the clubhouse and you find 15 men with fouls. Sharpening sharp the spikes up to cut somebody. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were a mean bunch of fellas. They used to get mad with me because I wouldn't cut people. My own teammates fussed with me and argued with me because I didn't cut anybody going into base. As fast as you can run, you ain't nobody supposed to throw you out. That's what they would tell me. But I couldn't, I couldn't see it. Eventually, they let me alone. But it was mean in that league. It was mean. Yeah, we scored a run and Cash knocked the umpire down. <laughs> no, this incident this really happened. They scored a run. It was one nothing. It was late innings. Doby was on second base. And Money Irvin was the next hitter. He had a screaming line drive. One hop to the shortstop, Frank Austin. He threw it to first base. And Doby was on off with the pitch. He never stopped at third base. And when Dennis threw the ball to me, well, Doby was only halfway home. And I went up the line to meet him. When Doby came in and on all fours, I went down on my knees. And the plate was about four feet behind me. And uh, Chick Solomon, he, he was uh, uh, writing for the Amsterdam News. He clicked the picture and it showed the home plate behind me. And the umpire called him safe. And I said, what? And my glove happened to hit him up under the chair. <laughs> and he fell back and he suspended me for three games and fined me, so. I just wanted to be a real good ball player. I didn't know. I didn't know whether or not I'd ever play, you know, professionally. I didn't ever know whether I'd ever play in the major leagues, but I certainly wanted to play in the Negro Leagues. You see, at that time, uh, we had to, we aspired to playing in the Negro Leagues. That's as, that's as, that, is, that was as high as our aspirations could go. And uh, because, now, uh, I, I would say, well, one of these years, maybe I could, I'd like to play for the Homestead Grays, or one of these years, I'd like to play for the, for the Newark Eagles, or I'd like to play for the Lincoln Giants, or I'd like to play with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. If you were a baseball player, you did aspire to, to playing with one of those clubs. Mm -hmm. Now, we never knew that later on we'd get a chance to play in the majors, but uh, those were our inspirations at that time. We loved the game. We loved the game. We, just like uh, Pint was saying, Pint Israel was saying. When we played against one another, we, we were like, we were really ferocious against one another. Uh, but that, after the game was over, <coughs> love and peace and harmony, and, but uh, it was nothing like uh, baseball in those days. Well, that's the way baseball was. It was something that you enjoyed doing. It's a fun game. What the heck? Yeah. You're supposed to have fun out of it. They make a business. They make it too, too serious now, really. When they told me they were going to pay me to play baseball, I said, they got to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I'd play for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh, you know, yeah. 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 yeah, I said, they got to be crazy. I always held all these people in esteem because they were great athletes, uh, and they had a dignity, a kind of uh, self-contained sense of worth. When we look back at uh, the segregation era, we we're, we're oftentimes think of the oppressiveness of it all, and indeed it was oppressive. Blacks were poor, southern blacks uh, in rural areas especially were without the right to vote. Uh, the great migration north had begun to show the signs of failure. But despite all of that, and un underneath the veneer of that oppression, collectively and individually blacks were able to accomplish great things. And individually, black men were oftentimes marked with the qualities of decency, respectability. These guys had great senses of humor and uh, they were great athletes. When I think of those qualities, I often think of Pop Lloyd of Atlantic City, New Jersey. John Lloyd was one of the finest uh, shortstops that, that ever played in the Negro Leagues. He was tall and rangy and uh, had a good arm, and more than anything else, he was a great hitter. There are many recollections I have about uh, Pop Lloyd. 
um, I, 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 the biggest thing I'd like to say about him was that he was, he was truly a, a, a gentle giant. And uh, he, was, he was strong. He was a strong individual. He was strong in character. He was an honest man. Uh, he was a, a wonderful person. And um, it seemed as though uh, adversity would just seem to fall off of his shoulders and he would never dwell on adversity. That he would always go to the brightest side of whatever might come up at any particular time. He was a lovable man and he was a great ball player. He won one St. Louis baseball writer. Referred to him as the greatest ball player. He, oh, he was asked to, was the greatest ball player, baseball player he'd ever seen. And uh, <clears throat> the sport, the uh, baseball writer said, <clears throat> "Well, if you mean an organized baseball, I'd have to say Babe Ruth." He says, "But if you mean <laughs> in all baseball, he says." It's an Atlantic City colored man named John Henry Lloyd. And he compared him to, to Hans Wagner. And Hans Wagner later said he, he felt honored to be compared with, or have John Lloyd compared with him. But John was a, I just loved the man. You can see that by the tears. I guess Pop Lloyd is partially the reason why I am the mayor today. Because, because Pop taught me to be patient and not to be an angry young man. You see, I was angry because uh, I had gone through the same thing as a professional basketball player, where we had uh, been uh, uh, a great ball player and uh, played with uh, the New York Grands, which was a professional team, and yet we were not allowed to play in certain places because we were not white. And uh, when I asked Pop, I said, Pop, aren't you angry about this? Uh, he said, uh, well, I'm disturbed a little bit, but uh, uh, it's just something that happens. And, and Pop would give you that old laugh, and uh, he would just keep on doing what he, he said, your time will come. And I've never forgotten that. Pop always would say, uh, your time would come. We, we, we talk a lot about uh, the civil rights movement and when it begins, who, who starts it. It may be that the civil rights movement had many beginnings. Uh, some of those beginnings are found on buses and lunch counters on, on dusky roads in the South and on the, uh, the playing field of Negro baseball teams. Uh, it seems to me these guys must have known that they were involved in the most American of all pursuits, competition. But they weren't recognized, they weren't lionized uh, in the larger American society. They were only recognized and appreciated, if you will, by, by their own people. So I think they must have looked forward to a day when, uh, perhaps on their own terms, they would be recognized as great athletes, great American athletes. Seems to me that those sentiments, that vision, um, is one of, the, one of the beginnings, one of the seeds of the, of the modern civil rights movement. Well, we were down in Mississippi one time, and we stopped in a gas station to get some gas. And the guy wouldn't sell us no gas. Oh, yeah, well, that happened. You know, things like that. I said, what in yeah. the heck is wrong here? It's, it's a period of, 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 of um, segregation and so on. Uh, even uh, on the high school, high school team, we could only play one or, or two black kids at that time. Uh, but um, an incident would crop up here or there. They, you know, they'd call your name or something. But, you, we, you know, uh, being black, we got used to that. and, and uh, and uh, we didn't let that deter us. Uh, sometimes, through adversity, I think it made us, uh, made, it made us better players because we try harder. They make us mad. And rather than, than fight or anything else like that, we would want to play so good until we'd beat the opposition. I think we had to develop, a, you know, we developed that kind of mentality. And I think that kind of mentality is what really uh, uh, took us through. Black people were only able to go to Rupert Stadium when there were black baseball games. Uh, we certainly were not welcome when the Bears, white, the Newark Bears, uh, were playing. But that didn't seem to bother people too much. It bothered a few of the so-called Young Turks of that day very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was one of the many, many, many of protest movements, because we did have protest movements before Martin Luther King. People tend to forget that. They think that the black protests only started with Dr. King, but I can tell you 
in New Jersey. It started long before anybody ever heard of Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King. Although you were segregated in terms of hotels and restaurants and that sort of thing, but you had, you, had, you had fun and you had a lot of people that came to see you play. And that part to me was, 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 was as good as, better than, the, than my beginning in major leagues because I, the freedom, I had more freedom, more comfortability. All this change in black American society uh, must have rattled uh, many important aspects of black life. But there were some constants during all of this. Black communities, uh, when we look back at them now, um, were vital, uh, remarkably stable, despite the pressures that were, they were always under. And even deeper into those, into those communities, we find um, very strong churches. We find uh, family life uh, having many vital characteristics. I think these ball players must have drawn considerable strength uh, from, from black communities. I think their families probably wish them well as they sent them off essentially to a world of travel and discovery that the average anonymous black person would never see. Well, my parents' reaction to my entering professional ball uh, was one of great pleasure. I, I don't recall my mother ever being a uh, witness to a ball game that I participated in, but uh, my father he, he was a baseball fan, and if I could go back just a few minutes to, to talk about an incident that occurred when I was playing baseball for the high school. Uh, he was sitting in the stands, and uh, it was the first game that I had participated in as far as high school was concerned. And, and uh, the star pitcher, who was uh, a white boy, uh, was knocked out of the box. and. Uh, the coach, Ty Alfred, decided to put me in. So when, after I'd warmed up and went out to the mound and the people were sitting in the stands and they said, uh, he overheard one of them say, uh, uh, what are they putting him in for? He says, uh, you know they can't think. And the bases were loaded at the time. Uh, no, yeah, the bases were loaded. And uh, so I went in and uh, the first thing that I did was to pick a man off at third base, which made one out. And then I struck the next two men out. And everybody in the stand stood up and shouted and yelled and said, what a great job he's doing. I said, boy, you gotta give him, and I had a second hand, I had a second team suit on. And they said, give him a first team suit. He needs a first team suit. I said, anybody pitch like that, it's gotta be a, a first team man. Give him a new suit. <laughs> and that was the kind of uh, comments that were made after that. And um, so he came and he told me about it and he said, you know, I was sitting right behind this man when he said that. And he said, boy, when you picked him off, he said, you should have seen him shut up. And when you struck those two men out, he said he, he was the first one to stand up and clap. One has to have a long memory uh, to document uh, Negro baseball, uh, at least the late 19th century. But certainly in the early 20th century, when blacks are moving about this country as a part of the Great Migration, uh, Negro baseball uh, certainly, certainly surfaces as an important uh, symbol of black accomplishment in cities, uh, black accomplishment on the playing field, and, and black business development. Uh, it seems to me that that new Negro era, long known for its poets and its jazz musicians and its intellectuals, must now be reconsidered for its sports figures. My experiences with black baseball go back to about 1914, 1915, when the Homestead Grays team was organized, a group of men who worked in the local steel mill, Jerry Veeney and John Veeney, Brother Pace, Bob Hobson, I remember those names so well, and uh, they used to play on Saturdays and weekends when they were off work, and I, I saw them organize a team that by 1920, had become nationally known because they were competing against some of the great teams uh, across the country, the Baltimore Black Sox, the Birmingham Black Barons, the New York Black Yankees, the Newark Eagles. These were black teams that would come in and play at Forbes Field where the Pittsburgh Pirates played. The Pittsburgh Pirates played, they couldn't play on Sunday, but the weekends when they were out of town, the Grays would schedule 
these teams, and they drew almost as many fans as the Pirates drew in those days in the, in the early 20s. So I had a chance to see them, and I had a chance to see this team as the Vini boys and uh, Bob Hobson and Brother Pace and them got older. Then they brought in younger fellas from other cities to play with the Homestead Grays. And by the late 20s, they were traveling around the country in seven passenger Buicks with a player driving a, uh, a, a car carrying 14 men which meant that a man might play first base today in Houston and tomorrow in, in uh, Dallas would be, would be pitching and whatnot. And so it was in, when they played locally in Pittsburgh. And they really drew in many places where fields that were open, where they passed a hat and whatnot. We had a city league here, and we had a club called the Haver Hills. They had some good ball players, several of whom uh, advance in the stronger league later. But Tom Jackson, who was a political figure, I think he had, he had the club. Uh, he decided he wanted a stronger club and he got, went south and he's gonna bring up a lot of boys from the south to represent Harry Bikerack, the mayor. They, that's how he came to get the, uh, he was mayor at the time, they called him Bikerack Giants. So he brought them up here from the south and they played at, at that time on an open park at New York Avenue. And they had some mighty fine ball players. Arthur Dilbert play any position on the field, pitch, catch, short, first, wherever you want to put him. Uh, Roy Roberts, another good pitcher. The, one of the finest shortstops you ever saw, Dick Lundy. They eventually went into what was known as the Eastern, Eastern Negro League. Uh, and they became one of the strong teams in that league, and they played the best, the Brooklyn Royal Giants, the Cuban Giants, Lincoln Giants, all the good, all the good teams and the good players, some of the best ball players at all in the, in the land. And they became a very powerful team. They won, I don't remember the year, but they won the championship one year and played in the Black World Series. I saw them in the late 20s, the organization of the Pittsburgh Crawfords by a man named Gus Greenlee. He was, was in the numbers, a very fine businessman, a good businessman. He built uh, Greenlee Field and up on Bedford Avenue in Pittsburgh, where we also had a chance to see some of these great players that came in. A fellow named Ralph Kiner, who, who came to the Pittsburgh Pirates later on. And I can remember a fellow saying, gee, that ball, and he hit it over, just barely over the center field wall. And I sat beside a guy one day and he said, I bet no one's ever hit a ball that far. I said, oh yeah. I, said, I saw a fellow a few years ago, 1938 in August, a fellow named Josh Gibson, who was still living and I saw him hit a ball 20 feet above the wall, which was marked 450 feet, which meant that it had to be seven, 800 feet into the trees in what they called Shenley Park. You hear a lot about Satchel Page. I'm not talking about what somebody told me. I'm talking about what I saw myself at the Westfield ballpark in Homestead, which is right next to the hospital in Homestead where they played. I saw him deliberately walk three men and then turn and say to him, turn, you stay there. It was, it was a show. You stay there at second base. You stay there. And then strike out the side. Such a page, as everyone knows, is the epitome of, of pitching. There was something strange about Satchel's ball. Satchel's ball always looked small, no matter, no matter where you looked at it, and for one angle you looked at it, it was always small. It never looked the size of a normal baseball. And it had to do with how he threw it, the speed, the velocity at which he threw it, and where he threw it. And you would look at it and you'd say, well, what happened to the ball, you know? Why is it so small? and it became, you know, very hard to hit. Josh uh, came up to, to Orange, where I was living at the time. I'm talking about, now, this is uh, um, 1936, 1937. I actually came up to Orange, and uh, we had a beer together. And I was just a youngster, and uh, I, you know, this is something that I'll, I'll always remember. And uh, 
Uh, and I cherish that moment now when I think about it, you know, this great player uh, who, act, who really didn't know how good he was, you know, hobnobbing and having a beer with him. Uh, it was, you know, just a very, very cherished moment. Now, uh, he would stand on a corner for a while and, and talk to some of the local guys, and, and they would, uh, uh, you know, they uh, pass the word throughout the community, come on, let's go to the ball game tomorrow because Josh is here, you know, the Grays are here, that kind of thing. And it caused a lot of uh, interest that way. The Newark Eagles had a big fellow named Mule Settles that I hardly hear anybody mention. But I never saw a man hit a ball that far and, and for distance with a, such a beautiful swing. We always compared him with Josh Gibson because everybody always talks of Josh Gibson, but nobody mentions my buddy Mule Settles. And he had some of the furthest drives I've ever seen in my lifetime. He looked like a big, stout fellow. Well, he was, went about 225 pounds. And the, the only thing small about him was from his knee down to his ankle. He, had, he didn't have large legs. And he had bad feet. But he just stood there and took a couple of waves with the bat. He didn't go through a lot of motions or anything. And then he held it back, and he went through that perfect swing, I called it. And I saw him play one Saturday. I was watching the game from the sidelines. And there was a fellow named Duffy pitching for the East Orange BBC. And in those days, they didn't outlaw the spitball, not in our semi-pro black leagues. So what he did, he used to bathe the ball in saliva put it to his mouth, and when he threw a pitch, you could see the saliva break off the pitch when the ball started to curve. You could see it fly off like a piece of snow. That's how much a spit and saliva was on that ball. And he threw one to Mule Settles, and you could actually see the saliva fly off of it when it went over the center field fence. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I just went to enjoy the ball game, regardless of who won. And a lot of times at these uh, games, there would be two teams from two different locales. You know, not necessarily a home team, but it would be, the, say, the Homestead Grays and, and, and the, the Crawfords. It was two teams from, from out of town. So you just pick one that particular day and say, well, I'm rooting for this one, I'm rooting for that one. But the main thing was to go to see these guys perform. We need to know more about this first black ghetto uh, from the early 20th century to the mid 20th century that produced uh, a number of organizations and institutions and personalities that had uh, a dynamic to them. All these, all these things had a certain dynamic. And one important dynamic of the first ghetto was business development. Stripped of its pretenses, it seems to me that black baseball was a business. Uh, run by businessmen and catered and, or supported, patronized in large part by black people with uh, hard-earned dollars um, supporting a black business that was extremely uh, vital and important to their lives. The Newark Eagles uh, became one of the better clubs in the, uh, in the Negro National League, uh, owned by Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Abe Manley. Abe, he took care of the uh, the uh, baseball end of it, and Effa Manley, his wife, she took care of the administrative end of it. And she uh, was a very pretty woman. She was very knowledgeable. She was very fashionable. And uh, she had a great following in Newark. And uh, at that time, I guess we, you know, playing at the Rupert Stadium when the, uh, when the uh, Newark Bears were away, we would draw, I'd say we would average about 5,000 fans, which wasn't that bad. Usually on opening day, we'd have maybe, uh, you know, 22, 23,000 people. Uh, uh, we usually play on a, on a Tuesday night, and we might average uh, six, 7,000. So it was, it was good baseball. Effa Manley, <clears throat> as a owner of the Newark Eagles, was the driving force behind the Newark Eagles. She's the, she was the kind of a woman that had a take charge kind of personality. And she would certainly like to uh, deal with the ball players, to have something to, say, have something to say about what they did or what they did not do. 
uh, what they wore, whether their suits were dirty, whether they should be clean, whether, <laughs> whether their pants were worn too low or too high, whether the caps were worn properly, and this whole thing, where the shoes were shined, and this whole type of thing is the, the kind of uh, uh, interference, in, in many respects it was, uh, that she would be putting out most of the time. Ethel Manley was certainly a woman who was ahead of her time. She ran a, a male-oriented business, a baseball team, like a man. Uh, she uh, was not only strict with the players, but she was a stickler for good behavior when people came uh, to the games. She used to have guards all over, and anybody who got unruly, wanted to throw a bottle or two, uh, was immediately ushered uh, out of the game. She was a good role model because she was successful at her business. And she inspired young women like me uh, to not be afraid to go into a business or to be affiliated with a business that was male-oriented. That was, uh, we were living in the days when chauvinism was at its height in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, and 50s, a woman's place was in the house. Negro baseball had its limitations, the most important of which was its fiscal limitations. Never enough money for all of the players. So some of these guys went to South America and the, the Caribbean, the African diaspora, if you will, where they uh, lived lives um, um, beyond the, 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 the shadow of segregation. Segregation and Jim Crow follows all black Americans, as we know, but it wasn't supreme outside of this country. One at a time, yeah, most of the guys, what, if they had $100 at the end of the season, that was a lot of money. So what we'd do, we'd uh, uh, contract right away to try to play in Puerto Rico or Cuba or Mexico or Venezuela or Santa Domingo to, uh, you know, to augment our, the little monies that we, we had. And what we would try to do, too, was to take our wives with us, you know, whenever possible. If you, you know, particularly if they didn't, you know, if we didn't have a family, if we just had one baby or something, a little, a little, uh, you know, child, you uh, you you try to take them with you. That is one reason why I I I I went and left the Eagles to go and play in the foreign countries because the foreign uh, places where we went to. They paid my expense, my family's expense, gave us an apartment and everything. And I, if uh, we had stayed with the Eagles, uh, we didn't have nothing. And then, just like Monty said, and then I, for, I say, at least 10 years for me, I left one league, went to the other league. I, I, I stayed in Mexico for seven years. All my expenses paid, and my wife, my kids, transportation, everything was paid, and my money was clear there. And after I leave uh, Mexico, I used to go back to Cuba. I was in Cuba, and I took my family there, and that was during the school time. They put my kids in school and everything else. That's the expense why I had, and that's the, that's the way I made up my contracts, and that, that's how I, I operated with the, the foreign countries. World War II brought about changes in black and white America but especially in black America, because blacks found themselves uh, very near the center of, 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 of the action, not only as soldiers, but as people envisioning a new kind of American society. Negro baseball once again serves as a, as a symbol of what is going on, and these ball players are coming back home with a new uh, vision of their role in American society as athletes, as men, and um, uh, it seems to me the war years represents a major watershed for black America and Negro baseball in particular. Well, I went in the Army in um, 1942. I was drafted, as most young men were at that time. I was drafted and I w went to Fort Dix. Fort Dix, I went to the uh, Richmond Army Air Base. <clears throat> From there, strange thing about it, when they told me I was going to the Richmond Army Air Base, first thing I thought about was uh, airplanes. I said, well, my goodness, I said, well, maybe I'm going to be a pilot or something. And uh, when I got there, uh, to my surprise, uh, I was in a service battalion. And uh, my job, uh, along with the rest of the members of my outfit, uh, were supposed to keep the officers' barracks clean, 
We're supposed to uh, service the streets and keep the streets clean, uh, do things of that sort. Uh, shortly thereafter, we went into uh, truck driver training, and uh, we went to Camp Lee for experience. And then we were shipped overseas. I went to England, and I spent about two months, I suppose, in England. And then from there, I went to France. And uh, I spent two years in France. And we left France, and I spent a, a, year, a year in Japan. In one of my stories, I had read that the black man had the best enlistment record uh, of all in that war. So I concluded one of my columns with, uh, if the black man was so willing to lay down his life for his country, he should be admitted to baseball. I knew I had a lot of ability, but it didn't make me bitter because I just felt as though, well, Someday, maybe the blacks will get a chance, but I used to say to Roy Campanella, it won't be during our time. Those are my very words then. We'll never see that because it's, it's but I think during the war did help. I the mixing of the troops later on. And not only they got more recognition by going off the war. And uh, I think that helped the blacks get into baseball. After the war, uh, uh, Dobie now starts to play with us. I came back from service, and some of the other guys came back, and we now uh, built another powerhouse. Max Manning and Rufus Lewis and Leon Day and Jimmy Hill and those fellows, and we, that's the year that uh, we beat Kansas City for the, uh, for the Negro World Series. We had a real good year. And um, at, at the uh, tennis-wise, we were way up, and you know everybody was hungry for baseball. And it was a banner year for the Newark Eagles and Mrs. F. Manley. Ever since the slavery era, black people have learned about their plight and their opportunities primarily from their own newspapers, the Negro Press. During the golden era of the Negro Press, the World War II years and the the, the years of the Civil Rights Movement, the Negro press was very good to and for Negro baseball. Uh, you learned about uh, the extraordinary feats on, on the field of play from Negro newspapers. And it seems to me that there was a reciprocal arrangement between the Negro press and Negro baseball. Uh, baseball helped to sell newspapers, and the newspapers helped to bring greater fame and uh, prosperity to Negro baseball. It really was a precious moment in the history of black business on the field and in the Negro press. The role of the black press in promoting interest in baseball and the interest of blacks in baseball and, and black players was very great because that was the only press that reported what they were doing. Very seldom, if ever, did they report of a baseball game even the Negro National League games get into the white press. So it was the black press that reported them. But even more important, it was these mixed games when the black players were playing the Major League All-Stars, they got extra coverage because it was only natural for us in the black press when we saw what they could do. We liked to boast about it, so we played it up. I mean, the stories about Satchel Paige and pictures like that striking out five major league 300 hitters, one after another, first was played up in the black press, then got to the attention of the white press. And so, to a certain extent, I'd say that we made the public aware of the existence of good black baseball players. We had the, the ratings, the batting averages, uh, the uh, home runs recorded. Every game had the box scores, with every uh, same as you saw in the daily papers. And the wonderful core of sports writers that we had all over the country. Mm -hmm. I don't even know them all. But uh, all over the country, those fellows would write human interest stories about the black ball players. They would, uh, they would tell you about you know something that happened in their hometown they would even print it in the paper if one of them got caught speeding in his car you know <laughs> that never reached the daily press and that's what we like the public likes to hear about we were just public 
just because we happened to be a black public, we had the same interests and f felt the same way about our sports heroes. When these guys came along and they started playing the kind of ball and people saw them here, uh, they would come out. Usually it was be on a Sunday when they're either after the season or during a, an empty weekend. And I always felt that that had something to do with the gradual moving of blacks into baseball because sooner or later, the owners were going to get smart enough to realize that the real important part of baseball was green, not black or white. And when they got, they found out, Ricky was the first to recognize it, that if you picked a guy who was exciting, put him on the team, you're gonna get people coming through the gates. Later, I think they found out something else. They used to claim you couldn't put a black on the team because the wife didn't play with him. They found out through Jackie Robinson first, and then as things went on through the rest of them, that green was the color there too, because there wasn't anybody on any team that was gonna get mad at a guy who was gonna get them into the World Series and get that loop. I never knew that the money would be there, the fame and all those kind of things. It was just, you dedicate yourself to be the best you can be. That's right. and, and had it not been for guys like yourselves, I know I wouldn't be there. So I appreciate it and it's good talking to you. And we enjoy, we appreciate you saying these things because, mm -hmm. and we're happy for you. Well, yeah, I, I'm and glad I know, yeah. that the money's there for you. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't there when we played. I understand. No, it wasn't there. If we didn't love the game, then we wouldn't have played it. Because yeah. <laughs> for the money, it was. It right. Wasn't, right, but it wasn't that's what I feel. I love yeah, the game. Love I like the game to play. And... You see me? You know, I'm yeah. serious now. I'm oh, a serious sure, ball sure, player, sure. but I'm smiling and having yeah, a good time sure. too. There was no question that this country and this uh, this sport that, I, that I'm now in charge of was not fair. And it took Jackie Robinson 40 years ago, together with Branch Rickey and Happy Chandler, to, to make it fair on the field to play. Now this year is a year we're dedicating to be sure it's fair off the field to play, so we can be an example again. And for Ray to come in this year, I think, has much more meaning. It's a, it's a year of focus. Right now, everybody asks me what my greatest thrill was. But my biggest thrill came when, March the 3rd, Mr. Ed Stack called my house. Yeah, you know, like you do, I was resting, my wife was in the backyard. So I answered the phone. The phone call said, I'm trying to find Ray Dandridge. I say, I'm Ray Dandridge. Say, you Ray Dandridge, the ball player? I say, yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he said, your life has changed. I say, what do you mean my life has changed? I, I, you know how it is. You, sometimes you get some of them crank calls. You know? <laughs> So afterward, me and them talk a while, and then he said, I'm Ed Stack, the president of the Hall of Fame, and you had just been elected for the Hall of Fame. <laughs> now, I want to sincerely thank each and every veteran on the committee allowing me to smell the roses. My only question is, why did you take so long? <laughs> I can see in the audience, I got a, quite a few friends, north, east, south, west, and these people have traveled a long way, and I want to thank each and every one for coming to Cooperstown to see me elected in the hall. Thank you.
in closing, let me say, if I had it all over to, if I had it to do all over again, I think I'll do the same way. I love the game of baseball, and I hope now today look like baseball love me. So now I'm going to say goodbye, and I hope and I love you all. May you never know how much I love you. Thank you, and God bless you all. Well, Big Boy was a real actor. He loved the limelight. He loved to lead a parade. He always wore one of those great big, tall, whatever they call him, you know, on the top. And he strutted, he chest out. He used to stand up in the back of that park and announce. or 16 before I realized that people did something else on weekends other than go to baseball games. Uh, my father played baseball practically every night of the week and after he stopped playing he umpired so all I ever knew was baseball. gave uh, uh, Mr. Manley and Mrs. Manley who owned the new gig was $15,000 for me. But then all of a sudden, as the years went on, they had no contracts. See, at the end of the year, you, you were a free agent, mm -hmm. although you belonged to Newark. Mm -hmm. So the, the scouts start scouting these people, and the owners start getting them for nothing. And that's destroyed the, the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. 